This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for this program is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Local Color. I'm glad you're here, Ashley. It's been a long time since we've talked books. Yep. And we've got some treaties at the end of the show. Yes. I can't wait to get to. Um, I'm kind of nervous but excited. I get to talk to Greg Gaston about the upcoming Super Bowl. I you're mean, going to talk sports? I am. Well, I, hopefully I can hold my own. I know a couple of things about football that I've got up my sleeve. <laughs> Good job. Okay. You know, I mean, I love football and college football. Um, sports, okay. not necessarily NBA, didn't say okay. that, but, um, and Pat is going to be here with Julie Parati from the Dixon talking nice. about present tense. Very nice. Hey, do you know about uh, Playback Matter or Playback Memphis? Yes, I've heard a little bit about this. Um, okay, it's coming up February 1st and 2nd at First Congo mm -hmm. uh, at 8 o'clock. And that is at the Theater South over on Cooper. Right. And their theme is Memphis Matters. So you tell me this is like a troupe of singers, dancers, actors, right? Right. And improv. And they uh, they come up with a topic kind of like to get the audience loosened up. Mm -hmm. And they do little skits related to that topic. And then they ask audience participation as in give them a topic. And... I, nice. I just, I know. Well, I, I understand that uh, WKNO FM has a performance club, um, and it's led by Christopher Blank, who is a theater critic. Um, and they're going to be going to Playback Memphis for this the, event. So this oh, is a good way to get involved with this. If this is kind of intro to theater for you, this is the way to step in. And that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. Okay, this says that they do stories about life and work in Memphis in a unique way and that the audience members are asked to participate. <laughs> now, I don't know what level of participation it is, and I should be so ashamed I, I have meant to go. They have it sporadically. Okay. Um, but go to our website, wkno.org slash local color, and we will have a link to right. Playback Memphis website, and you can go in and find out the information. But um, I'm excited about this week's show. I hope you'll check out Playback Memphis or any of the other great shows and exhibits going on right now. And Pat will be right back with Julie Parati from the Dixon. Well, we're here to talk about art, and you're going to tell us about a new exhibit that's at the Dixon yeah. called Present Tense, which I'm very excited about. Good. It's um, contemporary Memphis art, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the idea you go to a museum and you think that you're going to just see things from the past. Mm -hmm. And this idea of contemporary artists in Memphis, tell us a little bit about the exhibit. Yeah, it's called Present Tense, The Art of Memphis from 2001 to Now. It's something really different for us at the Dixon. You know, you kind of think of the Dixon and think Impressionism. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, we've been kind of quietly, not so quietly, showing contemporary, local contemporary art on um, in t some of our side galleries for about four and a half years now. So we wanted to do a really big exhibition to kind of honor that and to really show our visitors and, and the whole city of Memphis that Memphis is an arts town, not mm -hmm. just music, but visual arts as well. So this is a huge, huge show. It's over 100 works of art. So they're like 60 artists from, and I mean, it's the gamut. It's, mm -hmm. it's you know, Twin mm -hmm. and Nancy Cheers. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit Maybe of Harvard and it's, you know, the pieces on the website, you can look at the pieces, uh -huh. get a little preview. Yeah. Of, um, of what you have coming up, but it's not just one medium either. It's a little bit of everything. Yeah, definitely. There's actually 83 artists represented in the show. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it's painting, it's photography, sculpture, um, installation, video art. We have some outdoor sculpture out in the gardens and, um, and an environmental installation in the gardens as well. So how did you choose what artists? Yeah. <laughs> There's so many artists in Memphis. I mean, there are. How did you pick what was in what was a part 
part of the exhibit? Well, we have a timeline that runs throughout the show that um, kind of pinpoints the specific events in Memphis art history, Memphis mm -hmm. contemporary art history from 2001 to now. And we chose artists that, re that, that related to these certain events and that had, um, you know, a really major part in, in the Memphis art scene over the past 12 years. Well, I noticed that um, John Whedon is the guest curator, mm -hmm. and he's got this great little essay, mm -hmm. if you go to the Dixon website, mm -hmm. that talks about those events mm -hmm. and sort of put gives you a sense of place, you know, mm -hmm. how they mentioned it. And I, I was so impressed that it wasn't just the, the more formal... Um, the more formal galleries. Mm -hmm. There are places like, you know, the the, the Rozell mm -hmm. Artist Guild, which mm -hmm. is a perfect example mm -hmm. of, hey, we're gonna make art. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, it's great that Memphis has so many kind of kind of underground art movements, um, and that's what makes Memphis the Memphis art scene the Memphis art scene. It's mm -hmm. just these kind of uh, groups of sometimes renegade artists banding together um, and really making a statement. And, and when they do come together, they, they create wonderful things and come up with these really creative projects um, that, that kind of do end up bringing the whole city together in a weird way, you know? So for, um, for the Dixon, mm -hmm. this is definitely, you know, I remember last year you did the, you had an exhibit that was around the Hispanic community in uh -huh. Memphis. Yeah. And it, it really seems as though the Dixon experience is, yes, you can get the traditional experience of going in and looking at art, but we're really a part of the community mm -hmm. where, you know, we're getting involved with the community and mm -hmm. everything. And I know one piece of this, um, this whole exhibit that I think is so cool is you've got a student art piece. Mm -hmm. And so where did you, how were the students selected? Um, John Whedon, who's the guest curator, has been was in touch with a lot of uh, high school art teachers mm -hmm. throughout the city, and um, it's just a uh, the the teachers would submit the student work, and it was just kind of like a juried exhibition, like um, like the students will face when they become older and submit their work for juried exhibition. So I think it's a a great it was a great practice for students, and mm -hmm. and it is a win-win situation for us because we're able to show such a wonderful work. You will not believe that this work in the student part of the show was done by students. I mean, it looks, it's very mature. Um, the art teachers in the city are great and they're training this next generation of artists to, to um, make just as big of a statement as the artists that are in kind of the main part of the show. It's, it's really something that all Memphians can be proud of. Well, for the um, for the students, will you have will you guys have like an opening party mm -hmm. for the students so they can mm -hmm. get all of their friends to come? Yeah. And, <laughs> can you imagine if you are in you know tenth grade and you're like, well, you know, I'm being shown yeah. at the Dixon. Yeah. <laughs> well, we encourage all of the artists, uh, it, both in the student show and in the main show, to to come as often as they can. Tell their whole family. Tell everybody about it. Um, brag as much as you want yeah. <laughs> because we really want everybody in the city um, and then everybody in the state, everybody in the region to come see this and see what Memphis is doing right now and, and how alive the Memphis art scene is. I mean, I know y'all see this all the time, but it's great for the, the larger public to be aware of it. So how long does the exhibit run? Okay, it, it opens February 3rd, Super Bowl Sunday, mm -hmm. and <laughs> runs through April 14th. Okay. And we'll have lots of programming throughout the, the whole run of the show. Um, plenty of opportunities for, for everyone to come check it out. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, thank Julie, you. for coming and telling us about this. Mamie's up next with our friend, Ashley Dawkins, and they're talking about one of their favorite subjects, books. <laughs> Glad you're here today with some books because we haven't talked about them in a long time. I know, I and know. And I love the fact that Booksellers in Laurelwood does free signings, lectures, discussions. Yeah, they're all the time trying to bring some culture to our area. <laughs> I've got a big old stack of books here. Actually, we're going to start with Pamela Denny. Um, she's the food editor at Memphis Magazine, and she's written what I think is a really handy 
Guide to Memphis. This is the, the Food Lover's Guide to Memphis. So this is for locals and tourists alike. And it's So now, is this about restaurants or recipes? Uh, well, um, some recipes, but mostly restaurants. Good. And it's kind of organized in ways like, uh, let's see how she got this set up. Like the um, downtown Memphis, East Memphis, Midtown Memphis, just the way that we understand it right. in the suburbs. Of course, where you can go to get beer, cocktails, and pub grub, what's worth the drive, you know, from yeah. the Memphis area. And then she's got a few recipes here. And, you know, she's a food authority. She's been writing for Memphis Magazine for a long time doing this kind of stuff. I think this is going to be one of those things, uh, kind of like the, um, uh, what's the one you can, uh, the, um, Oh, never mind, I'm, I can't think of the name of it. Anyway, it's going to be one of those things that every Memphian should have and every tourist But you know what have. I like about it? I can see giving that for an out-of-town guest that comes in in, a, in like a little goodie bag. Yes. You know? Yeah, for like wedding parties yeah. and that kind yes. of stuff. Yes, yes, that's a great idea. Yeah. So tell me about Breathless Reads Tour. Breathless Reads, there are five young adult authors, and this is going to be on Valentine's night. Oh, by the way, Pamela Denny's signing is going to be Thursday, February 7th at 6 o'clock, and this is free. Um, the Breathless Reads Tour, there are five young adult authors, and they're, um, I don't know all their names, but Morgan Rhodes might be the most recognizable. This is all kind of fantasy romance stuff, and these ladies are bringing candy and cry, trying to make it a little bit more of a romantic thing, yeah. but this is just going to be a fun way to meet several penguin authors who are touring together. Um, the young adult section there at uh, the booksellers at Laurelwood, they do a lot of great signing events for kids and young readers. This is just one more great yeah, and example. and my daughter doesn't get, ever get out of that section. <laughs> and then Cover of Snow on Sunday, what is that about? Yeah, this one, okay, so I'm really excited about Jenny Milchman, and if you're familiar with the booksellers at Laurelwood, there's Scott, who's our mystery guy, and he's really excited about this, so if he gets excited, it's worth it. Um, she's I've been known Scott for thirty something years and never known him to be excited. So, <laughs> yeah, if so he's you excited, know, this is a big yeah. deal. Um, <laughs> the reason I'm excited about it, and I'm going to add this to my winter stack, is that she's being compared to Gillian. Flynn, which if you'll remember, Gone Girl was the big runaway hit last year, and I read that last summer and was completely taken with it. This is debut novel, um, a woman wakes up to find that her husband has committed suicide. Problem is, there's never been any kind of indication that he's upset or depressed, and suddenly she has to start investigating this on her own, and this sounds like a really, Ooh. really good read, so I'm excited. Ooh, well, what else do you have for me there? Well, let's see, we've got... I'm excited about this one. I am too. This is former Vice President Al Gore will be visiting us, and his signing event, I don't have that right in front I've of me. I've got it. February the 18th at noon. That's right, and that's something I want people to pay attention to. This is at noon. Most of the book signings during the week are at 6 p.m. This one's at noon. Um, they are, this one does require a line ticket, and the line tickets you get when you buy the book. Oh, so we could buy the book right now. Right. And go Actually, ahead and get her. Yeah, it comes out this week. Okay. So you can go buy the book now and get your line ticket. And the sooner you get it, the closer to the front of the line you'll be. Oh. There are some restrictions. He's only sign, signing this title. He's not signing memorabilia, right. that kind of thing. Right. Any, anytime they have any kind of celebrities like that, And it I'm sure it's nothing up. personal. Just no. he signs it and you move on. That's right. That's yeah. right. But hey, I'm excited about hey, this Hey, he's earned that. Yeah. That is really cool. Yeah, so if you're into to good new nonfiction, I think, you know, kind of like an inconvenient truth, this is just kind of um, a good tome on what we should be looking for as a society. Hopefully there's some lock boxes in there. <laughs> I had to. I had to. Yeah, don't say that when he's there, I would know, you? I know. And then who is Wiley Cash? Um, Vanity Fair calls him the Justin Timberlake of American literature. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so this is one that I'm moving to the top of my stack. I'm going to read this before the signing. Um, and actually, WKNO, the radio side of WKNO has a book club, and I think this is their pick. And they're going to get to meet and talk with him after his signing event. So this is a good chance to join up with the WKNO Book Club. Um, this is, I wrote down a great quote about him. Richmond Times Dispatch says his book, this is his debut novel, A Land More Kind Than Home, reads as if Cormac McCarthy decided to rewrite To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh my gosh. I know, right? Uh, NPR says this is great gothic southern fiction. He's a rock star, young guy, and this is kind of uh, Appalachian Foothills drama. So I think this is going to okay, be Okay, we've only got a few seconds left. What else do we have coming up? Um, the Bistro throughout the month of February will have uh, singer-songwriters on Saturday evenings from 6 to 8 p.m. They also have half-price bottles wine. of wine. Yeah, so go get some good free live music, some half-price wine, cruise for a book. Broaden your horizons. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ashley. Yeah. Um, those are really some great books to check out. The Super Bowl is coming up this weekend. Greg, <laughs> Greg Gaston is going to join me to talk about 
the game a little bit. Let's see if I can hold my own with him. Good luck. I'm glad you're here with me today. You Happy know, we to got here. a big thing coming up Sunday. Harbaugh, Harbo Ball, um, Brother Bowl. I mean, this is the first time in 47 years of the Super Bowl that we've got brother versus brother coaches. Yeah, and I think we're going to hear that story over until we're sick of it. Over and over and over. And, over. and I it wish is quite them, an accomplishment. It is, and I wish them both well. The last time they got together was, what, six years ago? Mm -hmm. And the Ravens won. Well, obviously when they get in, to a game situation. Forget about that brotherly yeah. love deal. It's out the window. Both these guys want to win. Both have proven how good a coach they are. Harbaugh, since coming over from Stanford, has done an amazing job with San Francisco. Uh, Jim Harbaugh. John Harbaugh has been with the Ravens now for a while, and he's proven himself very worthy. So these are these are good adversaries. I think this is going to be one heck of a game against two team with two teams that play old style football, really defensive oriented football. Although San Francisco a little bit different on offense, they're more modern with Colin Kaepernick. So Flacco has five years experience. Mm -hmm. Flacco's quarterback rating is like an 89.7. Um, Kaepernick has only been playing for two years, but really a starting quarterback for half a season. Exactly. And his rating is like 93 something. What does that mean? Well, rating, it depends on yardage, it depends on touchdowns, interceptions. I think sometimes that could be misleading. But in this case, what it's saying is Kaepernick, has, he's taken the ball and he's run with it. He became the starter, as you mentioned, midway through the season. Jim Harbaugh decides to take out Alex Smith, who was playing very well, and he does something that was controversial. Here's a first-place team changing quarterbacks midstream. In the middle of the season. But Kaepernick brings a whole different dimension. He can run with the football. They run what they call a read option. He looks at what the defense is doing. He can tuck and keep and run. He can throw or he can hand it off. It's more exciting. Well, it is. From Obviously, an offensive standpoint, absolutely. It's and, more exciting as a, a viewer, mm -hmm. but it's also obviously more exciting because the scores tell the story. Well, and it's also more of what we see in college is what Kaepernick's doing in San Francisco. Flacco is more the traditional drop back pocket passer for the Ravens. And what he has done in the postseason in his career is pretty amazing. It gets, uh, I think, brushed aside because we see Tom Brady and Peyton Manning and Aaron Rodgers and quarterbacks before them like Troy Aikman, Brett Favre, who have won Super Bowls. Flacco hasn't won a Super Bowl, but he continues to win road playoff games. And to win on the road is pretty impressive. Now, obviously, it's a neutral site in New Orleans. So now this would be the second time that the Ravens have been to the Super Bowl. Is that correct? Correct. They won the first time. And then this would be the sixth win for the 49ers that would tie my Steelers, which I'm not really happy with, so that's why <laughs> I'm going for the Ravens. But it's been a long time for the 49ers. They were dominant during the years of Bill Walsh as a head coach, followed by George Seifert with Joe Montana's quarterback, and then Steve Young, but it has been quite a while since they've returned. So they're happy to be back, and Baltimore, as you said, the one appearance, and it was a victory for them, with a quarterback, Trent Dilfer, not known for the big numbers, not known for... Uh, all these great victories. As we talk about quarterbacks in the Super Bowl, normally they're Hall of Fame quarterbacks. He wasn't. He was just a blue-collar quarterback, and they had the great defense with Ray Lewis on that team. Baltimore still has the great defense, but I think they've worn over the years. Ray Lewis is still the emotional leader, but he's not the Ray Lewis he was. Still well, a very good defense, though. And he's retiring this year. This I mean, is it. He's, Swan song. He's 38 years old. That's a lot of hits. <laughs> that certainly know? is. But he's still playing at a high level. It's just not as high as he normally is. Uh, five, six, seven years ago, this guy was a perennial all-pro. Still can do the job, but I think Baltimore, we, we know Baltimore for defense, but San Francisco has a heck of a defense. And they are led by their linebacking core, and that's Patrick Willis, who's from Ole Miss. He's from northwestern Tennessee, so he's somewhat of a, of a local product, and he is absolutely tremendous. He's worth the money. He's, he's worth the admission price to watch him play football. And then we've got Michael Orr, who is from Memphis on the Ravens. I mean, my goodness, I think everybody's cheering for him. And what's the guy's name from Collierville? Morgan Cox. Morgan Cox. Morgan Cox is the long snapper for Baltimore out of ECS. And as you mentioned, Michael Orr is from Briarcrest. So you got rivals. That's cool. Prep 
football in this area playing on the same team in the Super Bowl. And of course, everybody knows Michael Orr's story. Okay, the um, point spread is four points for the 49ers. Who are, what do you say? Well, it started at five. The early line was San Francisco by five. It quickly dropped to three and a half. So that, mean, that means money was going on Baltimore. And now it's right around four, as you said. Look, I picked San Francisco to reach the Super Bowl, but I also picked New England. And I thought New England was going to beat San Francisco. With that said, though, I like Baltimore. Me too. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Are you going to come back? I, absolutely. Anytime. I really appreciate it. It was fun. <laughs> Awful lot. And you, and you really did your homework. You knew your stuff. Maybe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. I, uh, I'm ready for the game now. Thanks. Um, now we need to plan for the menu for the party. Coming up next, Ashley and I are going to show you some great recipes to wow your guests. I'm absolutely high off of my interview with Greg Gaston. You know, I love Super Bowl Sunday, mm -hmm. but this is as much fun as the game. Yeah, I don't know who I'm rooting for, but I look forward to the Well, food. that's me too. And you know, we either have a party or go to a party. Mm -hmm. And if we have a party, I will do the beer and the ice and the plates and the forks and all that kind of stuff. But to me, the simpler, the better. It's just like this dip here. It is sour cream, some you can use either taco seasoning or some of your salsa, mm -hmm. and you throw in black olives, and it's amazing. Poncho's hot dip, which I Sorry. love. Sorry, I so made love. in West Memphis, Arkansas. Support your local color. That's right. You cannot go wrong with Poncho's hot dip. Regular old tortilla chips. I'm not really a, a chooser on tortilla chips. Unless you do, if, unless you go with the Las Delicias. Oh, those are wrong. Get those and go big with your local yeah, color. Those are wrong. Mm -hmm. Those are wrong. But now, what's your favorite? Um, I have actually, we have some friends who always host our neighborhood um, Super Bowl party, Michael and Christina, and they delegate out so we know that we've got the standards we go to. One of the things that she fixes that I love is uh, she gets the refrigerated cheese tortellini, cooks them, you know, boils them up, puts them back in the fridge, and then she takes a little container of pesto with a block of cream cheese, mix that together for a little dip, and then dip these cheese tortellinis oh, in that. Man. You know, and you could even sub in some of the, the low-fat or fat-free yeah. cream yeah. cheese, or maybe even go crazy and get the Greek yogurt, and that becomes slightly healthy. Oh, that's good. And this right here, are you familiar with Tiny Tim's Kitchen? Love the pimento okay. cheese. Tiny Tim's Kitchen mm -hmm. is, you can get it at Whole Foods, you can get it at uh, Fresh Cordelia's. Market, you can get it at Miss Cordelia's, mm -hmm. I think it's Safeway or something like that, mm -hmm. but it's a father, Tom, and his son, Ross, in their tiny kitchen, and it is amazing. It's, it's regular pimento cheese or the oh, Chipotle. Oh, right. You mentioned that, and I didn't even know that was available. I'm going to go check you that out. You know, and I always like to have some healthy mm -hmm. options as well. So I've got some sugar snap peas, and these are zucchini, and of course, your favorite wings. What was the number? 110 this is the big million yeah. pounds of wingless chickens walking around <laughs> because that's how many <laughs> wings we eat, and avocados. For right. guacamole. Right, I mean, Cinco de Mayo and Super Bowl are the big avocado days, right? And it was, it was some ridiculous number, like 140 million tons of chips are consumed. <laughs> now, there's one thing that I do not scrimp on, and that's scoops. You need scoops. I get the name brand scoops. And this is the uh, buffalo wing dip. It's my favorite. Mine too, and it's so simple. A can of chicken, mm -hmm. one block of uh, cream cheese, and again, low fat, no fat and then hot sauce. I like to use either Texas Pete or Louisiana hot sauce. You know, or you could go and do the Frank's Red Hot and use the, uh, the real buffalo sauce to go yep, with it too. Yep, because Frank's was the one that did mm -hmm. the buffalo sauce. Mm -hmm. And then I throw some uh, sharp cheddar in there, plop it in the oven and get it nice and bubbly. Mm -hmm. But there's one thing that I don't have here, but it's not my um, forte, did you see me gleek? It is the sausage dip. Yes, Ooh. it's Rotel with, with breakfast sausage. Okay, it's Rotel mm -hmm. with, isn't it cream cheese? You, I've seen it done either way. Either do a block of cream cheese or do a block of Velveeta and then do brown your, your Tennessee Pride or, or Jimmy Dean or whatever and then throw that in. And it's oh with the with the gre gosh. with the grease from that. Oh, it's so good. But now we like to we like to bring them out in shifts mm -hmm. and it's strategic. 
So what we do is we save the heavier stuff for the end. So like the last quarter of the game, when everybody's had their beers throughout the game, either to drown their sorrows because they're losing or to celebrate because they're winning, bring out the heavy stuff right. the last quarter and kind of put the beer in the back. You know, bring out some punch, some Let lemonade. Them sober up a little bit. Yeah, thank you. I wasn't going to say that. I was just going to say, bring out some heavy stuff. <laughs> right. You know, bready things. Um, That's smart. Pork tenderloin mm -hmm. on the little yeast. Little si Sister oh, Schubert. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, with some honey mustard That's or good. some horseradish. It just just as long as it's not fussy. It needs That's to be it. easy. That's like, it. Like this kind of walk around right. plate, easy because these are people who are celebrating and jumping up and down. That's they got it. a beer in one hand and they got to be able. To and, snack. and my favorite, my daughter used to call it uh, Jimmy Buffett style, where you just walk down the line, you know, and Jimmy it's just Buffett your little style. buffet where you just, and we, we just leave it out. And I love those great big um, containers that's got like three crock pots uh -huh. together. Mm -hmm. So you can just line those things up and have your chips out and replenish them as needed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what are you going to try? Are you going to try my Texas dip? Um, I'm going to go straight for buffalo. <laughs> That's my favorite. I am going to try this. Well, hey. I'm going to sample it all. Hey, you know what? Look behind. Hey, can some of you guys come up here? I know. I see you behind that camera, Clifford. Come on up here. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Come back and see us next week and go out and enjoy your local color. Okay, I'm going to go with the buffalo dip. I'm going to try a healthy dipping option. Oh, forget that. I'm going for the scoop.